My name is Peter Blake. I'm the director of the State Council of Higher Education. It's our privilege to work with all of you on the Outstanding Faculty Awards Program. Uh, for those who have attended one of the, one of the uh, awards ceremonies that we have over at the Jefferson Hotel, or those of you who have seen some of your faculty, or maybe some of you having been introduced on the floor of the House or the Senate, it is one of the most inspirational moments of my career to stand amidst the amazing faculty that we have in Virginia and to be able to celebrate um, with you, with them, on this occasion. So um, I want to congratulate those of you in the room who have been Outstanding Faculty Award recipients and then uh, encourage those of you from institutions who are looking to nominate folks from your institution for this prestigious award. Uh, I guess I also need to thank Dominion for uh, underwriting the cost of the program for many, many years, over, over 10 years now. I always ask a warning to any current recipients. I always ask the current recipients to serve on the peer review panel. It's kind of a time when their energy and enthusiasm for the program is high and um, they want to give back and they're really um, excited about the process. So um, they make really great peer reviewers. So I always ask them and other previous recipients from other years and provost and people that provost might recommend. So um, we, we do get really a good, you know, very quality level of people involved in the review process. And in addition to that, um, the panels are assigned to assign in their category. So if you're a peer reviewer from Master's Comprehensive Institution, you're going to review those submissions. The final review panel is um, staffed a little bit differently because we like to have a mixture of those type of academic folks, the provost and past recipients, along with members of the community or leaders from business or government. Um, we've had newspaper editors, we've had general assembly members. Um, obviously, members of the council are invited to review. And so I'm going to tell you what I tell them. So you're going to be receiving the same feedback that the reviewers actually get. One of the most fundamental things to keep in mind about this is that all of the, all of the recipients of Sydney Faculty Awards in Virginia are superlative in all four areas. This is not like, say, you know, I mean, those of us who've gone through academia and been faculty members and been either on tenure review committees or been administrators evaluating tenure packets, we're all used to the phenomenon of, you know, in reality, in a lot of places, there's one category of achievement that's really a sine qua non, and the others, you know, in reality, um, you have to make sure that you're not showing up as deficient, but, um, uh, but you know, if you, if you basically have acceptable teaching and service, so long as you have excellent um, research uh, accomplishments, in many places you'll be able to get tenure. This is not like that. Uh, there's no one of the four categories that is predominant over the others. And what happens when the group gets together to look at the final roster of, uh, of nominees to decide on the 12 who actually receive the awards, every single one of those people is a very, very highly accomplished in all four categories. I think Beverly reviewed the categories of the uh, institutional types. It's divided into research, master's comprehensive, baccalaureate, and two year. Uh, those are the institutional categories. We tell the reviewers that they need to take into account what kind of institution the person is coming from. Right? Um, you know, that's, you know, and, and you know, when, when you say that, of course, it becomes, it seems obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious to everyone when they come to this process. And another thing that's not obvious is exactly how you translate that mission sensitivity into a specific evaluation about someone. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that that's something that there's no formula for. We tell the reviewers that they need to review things holistically. They need to keep in mind what kind of an institution someone is coming from, and they need to evaluate their accomplishments relative to that kind of institution. In the spirit of Boyer, of course, teaching isn't just 
what you do in a classroom. It's a contribution that you make to student development in general, and it could involve things in addition to or beyond simply how successful you are in a face-to-face -face instructional setting. Similarly, with regard to Boyer and the discovery piece, um, you know, discovery isn't solely, you know, peer-reviewed articles in a physics journal with 10 co-authors done with funding from the NSF, right? It's choreographing a dance. It's directing a play. It's putting on a photographic exhibit. It may, it may be other kinds of things that I'm not even creative enough right now to be thinking of. Right? There is a whole range of activities that can constitute discovery. And so there's no such thing as a discipline that is not appropriate to this process. Although as a, as a realistic matter, there are disciplines where it can be a more difficult to document faculty achievement. You know, if you have a nominee coming up in a discipline where doing that documentation raises challenges, you know, you should think about that explicitly. I like to think of that category as a matter of connections. Um, you know, do you make connections with other departments at your college? Do you make, in teaching and or research, do you make connections with the community? Do you translate your knowledge as a discoverer of knowledge into applications out in the world, either in the curriculum or in real world applications. And again, um, I would say it really is the case that just about every single one of these nominees have accomplishments that are like that. These are not conventional, you know, good faculty members. Uh, they have, you know, they, they, they cross off all of the categories for, being a good faculty member and maybe even being an excellent one at an excellent university, but it goes beyond that. There's always a translation over into important, widespread, uh, practical realms of human activity. Um, the application service category uh, can be a bit of a tricky one. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind about that is that this is not again, your old style kind of conventional service in evaluating people for tenure. Committee service is not enough. Um, uh, departmental service isn't, isn't enough. This, the, everybody who rises to the top or close to the top in this process has very, very substantial service accomplishments on campus, in the community, within national organizations. It's always way beyond just so-and-so served on a lot of, you know, even served well on a lot of committees. Um, I'm here to tell you that these workshops help. That was where I learned that I didn't know anything about how to submit these applications and that I had to have a process for uh, submitting these applications at our institution and I needed to figure that out um, right away. And so what, what I did was I started by um, what I always do, creating a, a community of helpers um, to assist me in this process. We had the um, good fortune of having some prior Chev Award winners who were still at the institution, and so I called on them to be sort of an advisory slash selection committee for me, um, with me is what I should say. And so we go through a process of um, doing a soft call, and by that I mean it's not a big public call because these have to be very, very special people. So we go to very specific kinds of things. We go to sort of award winners, I'm sure this is gonna be familiar, from other, or from other sort of places. We look at sort of promotion and tenure committees and ask about people who've come up for full recently who we might have our eye on. Um, we have a designation at George Mason called university professors, which are people that are even a level above the full professors, our distinguished faculty. So we go to some of our award winners to try to do that, and then I'll have conversations with the deans and, and the provost um, after renewal, promotion, and tenure every year to see if there's somebody on the radar screen that we ought to be paying attention to. When I was asking Beverly sort of how to prepare remarks, she said, you know, says what works and say what, what doesn't work, and I guess, um, something that doesn't work is trying to cajole or lead somebody who is on disinterested in submitting one of these to try to do that. It is way too much work. It is way too complicated. There is not, um, it does not work to sort of lead somebody to water if they don't want to drink it. So you really need people who are willing to go through the learning process with you. And so that's just a, a tip I would give. You might have somebody who's absolutely perfect, but if they're not interested, they're not interested. And I, I sometimes try to leave the window open that maybe in another year when this, you know, 
impending sort of book deadline or big grant deadline or big other kind of commitment is over that, you know, I hope that they'll be open to a conversation in the future about this. And then sometimes I can get the provost or their dean or something to have a casual conversation over the next year or two with them. But it's, it's not something that you can, um, you can make somebody do and have it be done well. Um, there are some places where people tend to get stuck. Um, you know, creating that narrative story. A lot of people, all this knowledge that they have has become tacit. So they don't actually know what their story necessarily is. And so you have to really help them get some strategies for understanding how to sort of develop that narrative. It takes longer than they anticipated. Getting the evidence takes longer than they anticipated. Um, pulling together and collating the remarks from their peers and colleagues and former students and alums and everybody who's out in the workforce whose lives they've touched can take longer than they anticipated. So um, certain things are important to get started on, on sooner. One of the things that also happened is we used to, as we do with many teaching nominations at the national level or state level, we were sending the nominations directly to the nominators to say, could you please work with your, your nominee and get this um, yeah. packet together? That was a really bad idea. We had just done that over the years, um, and it was kind of what was expected. But we really started sending things directly to the, nominate, or the nominee, I should say, and copying the nominator for the University Teaching Award. And that they were supposed to help them, but it didn't fall on the, the nominator like it did in the University Teaching Awards process. And the level of, or the quality of proposals or applications has gone up pretty dramatically mm -hmm. since that point in time, because I think the faculty member is far more invested um, in the process than their nominator, who's usually a department chair or, or a colleague who has administrative responsibilities. Um, we also created a template for our nominees. It was amazing, to your point, the technical review, how long we were spending on formatting. Um, I was amazed that you'd have faculty who would think to, you know, do point four margins, um, which then puts them, you know, two pages over on the content. And so we were really spending an inordinate amount of, t inordinate amount of time on, on formatting, um, even, you know, double spacing versus space and a half. And that really took a lot of content out of the proposal um, or the nomination. So we had put together a template that said, do not change these, um, you know, formats. There's some styles in Word that I didn't know about that an administrative assistant in our office went in and did that template. Um, it's been very helpful. Last year, we did not have to do any font size or, or spacing um, modifications. Um, because that took away the focus on content, the substantive issues, and so we really wanted to help faculty focus on that. Whatever process you develop, it has to be organic to your institution, your institution's faculty, and your organizational structure. Uh, and, and it helps if, if the process fits in in uh, the least uh, obtrusive way possible, unobtrusive way, most unobtrusive way possible, because what that's going to do is make it seem more like uh, the rhythm of normal business rather than something that's uh, kind of extraordinary in and outside the regular uh, business that gets done. Basically, right now, I coordinate the, uh, the entire process. Uh, I work with the nominees as they develop their sections of the packet, uh, and I am the person who makes contact with individuals who are going to write the letters from which we draw the excerpts that mm -hmm. fill the uh, letter of reference uh, excerpts. So my responsibility is to send out the, uh, the invitation to the, uh, the letter writers that the, the nominee has indicated are, are persons who could speak to uh, their their qualifications and, and credentials, and then I send out the reminder, and then I send out the reminder of the reminder. And while our faculty are putting together their uh, summary of, uh, of accomplishments and their CV and their uh, personal statement, those are the parts that our uh, faculty nominees work on. Uh, I'm gathering the, the letters, I'm reading through them, putting the excerpts together as a draft, and then I give that to the faculty member, and then they review that, and we talk about whether or not uh, they like the collection of excerpts that have been put together. Uh, we've done this simply as a division of labor. We have begun to be a lot more deliberate about renominating individuals. It, it's a chore to put a fresh packet together each year for three or four nominees. And so even though we have some uh, candidates who don't make it to the final round, uh, we may come back in the next year and say, well, you know, this is a candidate that, that we think's got some potential and we want to resubmit them again. 
and work on improving a packet rather than creating a whole new packet. So we've been much more thoughtful and deliberative about that. Uh, at the last OFA workshop I came to in this very room, uh, I learned from one of the reviewers of the final panels that this person liked to read the personal statement first when they got the packet. And that got me thinking, why don't we write the personal statement first? Uh, and so we went from a process where there was no direction to the applicant, say, you know, you've got to put together your summary of accomplishments and your CV and your personal statement, so get busy. This last year, we worked with everybody's personal statement first. Uh, what that did was that helped us to personalize the nominee and to differentiate them from their competitors uh, because we were focusing more deliberately on what's the, what's the narrative, what's the story, what's the thesis of this application package. A good story is genuine, it fits the person, uh, it has organizing potential for the rest of the packet. It has some significance, and in the, by that I mean it links directly to your institution's mission statement. And finally, it personalizes the applicant. And so we kept those four points about genuineness, organizing potential, significance, uh, and personality in mind as we worked on the personal statements. Boyer's four categories should be addressed in the order in which they're listed, not in the order that you think presents the candidate in the best light. We've been doing it the other way, and I, I learned that we're not supposed to do it that way, so I had a nominee who said, well, you know, I'm really strongest in this category, I wanna lead with that, and I'd say, good luck, loser, you know? <laughs> you wanna be a winner? Follow the guidance. So, you know, I'm, I'm being videotaped, I'm gonna retire shortly, I don't really care. <laughs> Um, when I first got the packets, I was overwhelmed. I thought, how am I going to differentiate between all of these incredible people? Uh, these are the creme de la creme. These are the, the best and the brightest uh, of Virginia faculty. And so I approached it in the way that I approach grading papers, which is that I read about 10 of them, didn't try to evaluate them, and just read about 10 of them, and then stepped back and um, asked myself, how, how am I going to differentiate among these people? And I, I really appreciated the comments that Kim and others this morning made about telling a narrative, have, encouraging the candidate to tell their story. Because um, I didn't try to you know, read all of the personal statements and then all of the um, teaching statements and so forth. I, I read each application as a, as a unit and tried to get a sense of the person behind the, the application. Craft their narrative in a way that each section tells a story is helpful, so that it's not just a laundry list of, of accomplishments, because they all have their laundry list of accomplishments. Um, I was looking for examples of high impact practices, uh, encouraging uh, students to do service learning or uh, get involved in undergraduate research, um, taking research to the classroom, those kinds, those kinds of activities that we all know are so incredibly valuable. I'm looking for the passion behind the application. Um, not that you're writing the script for a Disney movie, but that, um, that there is uh, dedication behind, uh, behind the application. So this is not somebody who just excels, but um, has uh, found value in that excellence. It's somebody who who is um, going to um, impress upon those around him or her with the incredible work that, 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 tr that they're, they're doing. You know, volume of work, I wanna see a trend, I wanna see things that are high impact, so if you've, you know, if you've written the text in the field, if, you, if you've done the, the Sentinel work, you know, I wanna see that, if you've had a big grant or collaborative grant that's rolled off, I wanna see that as well. So the process I go through is one where I'm really trying to differentiate between you know, people that really have an outstanding record and then people who I really feel do, oftentimes do very ordinary things in a very outstanding way. We've had a lot of conversation at our level about this whole question of the scores, of the teaching scores. Have you already had that conversation a little bit? 
Let's get your perspective on that. <laughs> well, I, I've gone through a couple of different iterations where we get into this heavy discussion of when the scores, there is a guidance that the score should be included, but there isn't a requirement. Isn't that, is that correct? You don't have to include the scores, correct? Um, These are teacher evaluations. Yeah, teacher course. evaluations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. The guidelines recommend it, but do not require it. Okay, so there's been some individuals on our review team that feel that the absence of that is, you know, um, a very negative for the individual because that they should be able to promote. And it, and it, and in essence, as the, during the time I've been a part of this process, more and more people have been including those. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that, um, and I do think it's important, but I don't think it's the only criteria. If you feel like it represents the essence of the application, use it. If you feel like you're using it to show someone what the teacher looks like or any of those, I would say bag it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I do always find it interesting the choices people make in terms of what they put in the additional documentation section, um, because that's really a place where you have tremendous flexibility. And so th I think what somebody chooses, how they choose to represent themselves in that section is often quite revealing. Uh, so when I'm having a tough time deciding um, on, on a particular application, I, I spend a good bit of time with that, with that section. Can you give an example? Of I, I think a bad would be, um, an, uh, uh, actually there's some things co come to mind quite clearly, are, are situations where somebody clearly took all the stuff that they, they didn't, hadn't used previously and just threw it in there without mm -hmm. any organization or, or um, thought to creating a, a coherent section. Um, but when somebody really clearly put some time into crafting something that continued the message that we heard about earlier, um, uh, I think that, that that's very revealing. And I've never seen one discipline um, have the advantage. I think when you get really down to evaluating an individual, um, their discipline matters, but it's really how they do it. And, and, and I've been amazed at how some of these applications are for teaching very different kinds. And that, one of the things that I like the most about the way Chev manages this whole process is that you have these different categories so that you, to the extent you can, you're comparing a, a peer group, um, which I think is very helpful. Yeah, so the process works and it's very, it makes you proud from what I do, to see people in the, in the arts world or humanities who are doing just amazing things. You know, I mean, excellence, you know, is relative to the field you're elevating, you know, and, and it's, it's probably, it's different, you know, to be a great musician is different, but still you can see the greatness. Or see a theme of many themes that you can focus on and then branch off from that for all the different components. Here's what, you know, if you have your story and your theme, it really already fits these different categories, and here's, here's how it does. So you start with your uniqueness. You don't try to fit yourself into some other mold. So those are my recommendations. Thank you. So I knew I had to be vested in the process. I knew I had to be there and to be um, ready to do my part and not just get the nomination and sit back. So um, this nomination took place in the spring by the faculty assembly. <clears throat> and then in May, I had a first meeting with the vice president and with the public relations specialist. And we just went right directly to Boyers and we looked carefully at it. What are the criteria? What do we, what do we need to look at? We then looked at our college mission statement. We looked at the VCCS statement and the college mission statement and broke that mission statement into those four categories of Boyers. Uh, then uh, we agreed that I would go off and gather all my student evaluations. Thank goodness I kept them. This is very important. Um, and I put together a list of people from my past and the present, colleagues, former students, um, people in the research field that I'm in, uh, from all different domains, and so that my um, public relations specialists would be able to put together a letter and solicit um, any responses that they wanted to give for this nomination. Meanwhile, I agreed I would go back and write my personal statement. And I do believe, I do believe that's the driving force. The driving, it was a driving force for me. I am, 
I did not receive this award on my first try. I received this award the second time. A couple years later, we decided, okay, let's, let's do this one more time. Because we had been told sometimes the first time doesn't work. And actually, I think it was a good thing because the second time around, I had many more things to add in terms of documentation and had a big presence on the web in terms of my music, so that I think that was helpful. Because I can write something which is sort of logical, logically you know, organized and grammatically correct, but that's not the same as writing something that's interesting for other people to read. And so for me, that was the big part, is to get that advice from those faculty about how, about how to put this together. And the, the big hurdle I had was with the personal statement. And um, you know, the first few years I had the personal statement, I thought it was great. I mean, I thought it was at least expressed who I was. You know, I thought it, it said what I, what I was about. And, I could tell that they thought it was a little bit boring or you know, maybe a little bit preachy or something, and I, but I didn't know, you know what to do differently. I would add examples. They would say, can you put some an example in here? And, and I, I have a real appreciation now for what it's like to teach writing. You know? <laughs> I mean, it was very hard for me to, 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 re, to try to do what they wanted. I was trying so hard to, you know, to, to make that statement. I, you know, anyway, in the, in the, for the final year, they were sort of like, you know, this, 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 there's no you in this. And I was like, the whole thing is about me. I just did not really <laughs> understand what was the problem or what I should do differently. But I just sort of scrapped it and started over and wrote more about, you know, just wrote it very quickly, you know, almost like you described, just wrote it. And, um, you know, this is what I did the last two years. And, and they were, you know, happy with that. So, I, <laughs> you know, I can see that that personal statement was more interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting personally involved in the person and uh, help them understand, you know, what, what they see in their career, particularly in all the different categories. Uh, we can, you know, you can, Kim could see stuff about ourselves that we couldn't see because we're lost in talking about our research accomplishments or we're, we're so used to giving a logical argument that we can't really see it from a level that would be needed for this award. And then getting personally involved up front with the person helps them become motivated to actually start writing and getting stuff down on paper. I really thought they were personally interested in helping me do this. It wasn't just, we need an award for our institution. It was like, we really want you to get this award. So that was mm -hmm. important. And then keeping on a the time frame, we. I guess at New River, we got too much going on. But in the summertime, um, that was like the only time that we knew that we could take care of this because once school would start, we would have no time. So we did not wait until August or July, August or September. By the end of June, um, we had done most everything and then it was just editing and then maybe some more editing. But I, after that, it was like the, the big effort was over in terms of compiling and mm -hmm. putting things together. So keeping on a, on a good time schedule mm -hmm. so that no one is stressed by it. My personal impressions are um, no matter what size of institution or type of institution if, um, or how many staff are available to work on packages, I mean, it's certainly possible to put together a quality package with a nominee who's invested in the process and the right type of support that's appropriate to your institution and your organizational structure. Um, we at SHAV are always willing and available to answer questions that you have about the process, um, if we can, I and mean, we can't tell you how to go about it, but um, we can clarify any parts of the guidelines um, or the process that you, you, you need.